This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea as to the meaning of the word? Chris on time, Andrew in place. This feels like it's been ages since this has happened. <laughs> it sure has. We're going to hang out in person next week. Yeah. The last three episodes I've started by trying to get Andrew to tell me his middle name. And I got an email about six hours after we finished recording with Amanda from Paul, our editor, and he searched the internet and found Andrew's middle name, (laughs) which Andrew then said, by the way, I sent you a picture of my passport and I've just been waiting for you to realize that. So I've had it this whole time. Yes. Good job, Jason. (laughs) Yeah. That's kind of like a big update in my life. I got Andrew's middle name. Mm-hmm. Still have yet to talk to Andrew's mom, but on my list. So. Well, I told you how you had to make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> I will make sure you record all your meetings. Yeah, I have big problems not remembering what happened in meetings. All right. Well, we have a lot to cover today, and I'm excited to talk about all the topics we're going to talk about. So we have Ramir Rajan with us from Dragon Ruby, Ruby Motion, the Ruby community all the Ruby things. So welcome to Remote Ruby and thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. So I want to start back in early, mid 2010s. Is that what we call it? The 2010s? The 2010s. There, yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah. There is a library called Ruby Motion and it's still around today. And it was around building iOS and Android apps using Ruby. And if I'm not mistaken, that's what you use to launch a pretty successful iOS game. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. A dark room was my first smash hit first commercial game. And I hit the lottery. I hit the jackpot with that thing, but yeah, it's crazy. So I would love to hear how that came to be and what your experience was like using Ruby motion for that. Yeah. So the crazy thing was that I was actually a .NET development for like 13 years. So I think this point, I still have more .NET C Sharp experience than I have Ruby experience. So I could technically say I'm stronger in C Sharp than I am in Ruby. But yeah, I just got burned out on corporate stuff. And I was like, I'm going to quit my job, got rid of my PC, all that stuff. I had a Windows phone and I got rid of the Windows phone. I was like, I'm going to get a Mac, I'm going to get an iPhone and just dig into the not .NET world. And I had no idea what I was doing at that point. <laughs> but the interesting thing was I was got introduced to Ruby through Rake. So I was doing build automation for .NET using Ruby. And it's crazy. It's like, I'll like talk with people. Yeah, I've got about a decade of uh, Ruby experience and I have like two years of Rails experience. And they're like, what? How is that even possible? But yeah, I got the Mac, wanted to get into iOS development. Objective-C at that point in time, I didn't really appreciate how good of a language it was. And I had familiarity with Ruby. I was like, "Ah, I don't want to learn Objective-C. I want to try to build an app. And then that's where Ruby Motion came into play. So after that, I guess the rest is history. Ended up porting a web-based game called A Dark Room, collaborated with the original creator and like remade it in my own vision, released it to iOS. And then like five to six months later, it got like maybe 10, 15 downloads a day. And then just April 2014, it just hit the number one spot. It just went viral and just, just stayed there. And that was crazy when that happened. But yeah, I used Ruby Motion for that. At that point, Ruby Motion was owned by Laurent Sanzanetti, who was the initial developer and creator of, of the runtime. And you mentioned earlier, like you mentioned the concept of library just to get in some of the technical aspects, is that Ruby Motion and Dragon Ruby, which is essentially the core, and we can go into details about that, they're runtimes. So the idea there is that C Ruby is a runtime, M Ruby is a runtime, Truffle Ruby is a, basically they're different implementations of the Ruby language. And so that's a really important distinction between a language and a library or a runtime and a library. For example, just because we're going to be talking about game development, you've got .NET Core and C Sharp. So .NET Core is the Microsoft's implementation of C Sharp. So that's the runtime. And then Unity has their own implementation of C Sharp. So they've got their own custom runtime. And it's built off of Mono, like a decade-old version of Mono that they continue to maintain and update. And so... You think about performance profiling and you say, well, if I run this specific algorithm in .NET Core, you you get different performance profile than you would if you used the Unity runtime. And it's that same facet. And so you hear people say, oh, Ruby's slow. It's like, well, Ruby's a language. It can't be slow. What runtime are you talking about? 
Usually they mean C Ruby or actually MRI Ruby, which was way, way back in the day 1.9. But these specific runtimes is kind of a really important distinction to have. And so Ruby Motion is a runtime and it's a runtime that leverages the Objective C runtime. And then Ruby Motion has another facet, which is the Android flavor of it, which leverages the JVM and the C runtime. And then there's Dragon Ruby Game Toolkit which uses the MRuby runtime. I'm working on getting all those things like kind of consolidated into one runtime to rule them all kind of thing. But yeah, Laurent Sansonetti, he built Ruby Motion. I made this smash it. I ended up making four or five games after that. All of them did well. So apparently I've got a knack for this. So it was good. And then 2016 is when I acquired the company from Laurent and started expanding past that, thinking about, well, mobile is a platform that I can target. I got a approval to release my games to the Nintendo Switch. And it goes back to the same runtime aspect. like, how do I get Ruby to run on the Nintendo Switch? And so the runtime was expanded and that's where Dragon Ruby Game Toolkit kind of emerged from there. So it's still going good. I think it'll be three and a half years since the engine has been in development. And it's great. It's fun working on games full time. Yeah. And being an indie game dev, it's sure beats so working on tech software. I can imagine I'm curious when it comes to Ruby Motion. So, if you're using Ruby Motion, require you to still learn some of the iOS frameworks. I don't know. I think there's like Cocoa, things like that. Any type of things that interact, do you still have to know how to use those, and you just implement it in Ruby? Yeah, absolutely. So the idea is that there's UI button. So UI button is an Objective C class, and because the Ruby Motion runtime is compatible with Objective C you can initialize an instance of that class and use it. So that was a facet of Ruby Motion. That was a challenge was that when I was porting my game over to Android, a lot of the business logic, like the backend code and the game logic, I could use in both environments because it was just plain old Ruby objects. But then when you start looking at UI stuff, it's like, okay, well, Android uses UI widgets and iOS uses UI button and Windows might have different facet and then and all that stuff. So I ended up having to redo a lot of that UI layer, abstract, pull out and abstract what I could, but there was that reinitialization and rewriting of that code. And that's where kind of Dragon Ruby Game Toolkit came into fruition was that I need a rendering pipeline that's consistent across all platforms, Mac, PC, Linux, Steam Deck, Wasm, all the things. And what does that look like? And that's where that evolution came into play. The great thing is that all the docs that are available on like Stack Overflow or whatever, you see them, oh, here's how you do a programmatically create a button. Well, you squint and tilt your head and you can translate that Objective-C code into Ruby and it just works. And so we're able to leverage a lot of the foundational knowledge that's out there and can natively support all the libraries such as AF networking, a lot of the core libraries that exist out that are just battle-hardened libraries out there. We're, we're not reinventing any of that. You can just leverage those things. But that's the trade-off. Well, I've done everything in iOS, but now I go to Android and I've got this other thing that I've got to learn and pull into. You've definitely seen people try and solve that using web technologies like React. So React Native, yeah, React. they try and target both. But then you still kind of end up where even if somebody gives you the base similarities, you still eventually have to get down to like the difference in the two. And that's the unfortunate reality of like mobile development and app development. It's just a lot of the libraries out there are, are pretty well-baked for iOS. But the moment you start using them for Android, there be dragons and the devil in the details. And it's the reality of our landscape. We kind of work with what we have, but it's difficult. It really is. And just moving towards that idea of, can I get something that I write once, have one code base and actually works in all these environments. And that's kind of what I'm pushing forward. With so an I emphasis feel on like, game dev. Yeah. And I feel like we're close to lodging the softball, getting a dragon Ruby. You mentioned that you actually acquired Ruby Motion. So I'd be yes. curious to hear some of the thought process behind that and how taking over a runtime like that has been. I guess good news for Laura. He's like, yeah, I'm ready to retire. And I'm like, that's nice. And he's like, you want Ruby Motion and take it over? I was like, sure. How hard can it be to work on a runtime? Yeah, that was fun. It's one of those things where it really is a humbling experience and it makes you appreciate all the contributions, just Ruby as a language. And all the open source contributors that are out there. I mean, the entire language, you know, you've got maybe three or four like core contributors to C Ruby and a number of probably 20 or so 
answer can contributors that have very specific facets to the language, but you, you gain a serious appreciation for the engineering that goes into building a runtime. But yeah, that was a trial by fire. I spent basically in 2016, I was like, all right, well, I need to go heads down and really understand this environment and see how I can push it to other platforms. And it was a grueling two-year experience. And it's one of those things where it's like, I thought I was a good developer. And then you get thrown into that and you're like, okay, I know this. And I will never say I'm a good developer because there's going to be something else that I'm going to jump into. And it's always going to be that feeling of imposter syndrome. Some of the books that that really helped. It was Ruby Under Our Microscope. It's kind of dated because it covers a lot of the old facets of the runtime, but it's a fantastic book and it really helps you understand the machinery and the language, how this stuff actually works. And that's kind of what I really had to dig into, game proficiency with C, C++, and understanding how form function interface is another important topic. And I think if you're a Ruby developer, one of the best things you can invest in is understanding how to make a C extension. So taking a C library or C++ library and lifting it up and exposing it into the Ruby language, that's a superpower that will yield dividends over and over again. And the big facet of that is primarily the libraries that are out there for C are so battle-hardened. It's ridiculous. There's always so concerns like, well, this gem is not being maintained anymore or XYZ is not being maintained and at the end of the day, it's like, well, there's probably a C library that does exactly what I needed to do. And it's probably lightweight and kind of functional in nature that you can wrap and get 80% of what you want and have that maintainability there. And I think that's something that I think more Ruby devs need to realize is that going downward and getting some experience with building those form function interfaces is an incredible boon. So you talked about the difference in having targeting iOS, targeting Android with Ruby Motion. You've got basically a runtime that has to talk two different languages. What were some of the other issues you ran into or difficulties that kind of inspired you to build one runtime to rule them all? The biggest challenge there is that with the Ruby Motion runtime, the evolution of the language for Ruby 3 and 3.1, you've got some language enhancements that come in. Integrating that into the runtime is a little bit harder. And the other challenge is that there's core classes that exist inside of CRuby or MRuby or your core lib that don't exist in these other runtimes. I think like the record class would be something that recently came out where you've got an immutable data structure that you can initialize. So there's an expectation where I was like, well, I want to be able to use that across all these platforms. But to have a native implementation that works in Java in Objective-C and all these other languages, it's a lot of work. So the idea of having this one runtime to rule them all is to have these, I call it like a multi-level runtime. So you've got this top-level polyfill that is essentially MRuby. So the idea there is that if it exists in the MRuby core lib or can be ported easily in MRuby, then at least you have it at that layer. And then as needs come in for like, oh, we need a more performant version of XYZ. Well, now I can drop down through that polyfill and say, I'm going to create a native Objective-C implementation of this thing that mirrors what the polyfill does for me. And so that's the idea of this like one language to rule them all is to stay abreast to all the new enhancements that are coming to the Ruby language. And at the same time, cross-platform offering across all these different platforms and chipset architectures. But that's kind of the idea and why we had to partition it that way. So at the core, when you're on iOS, you've got the Objective-C runtime that you're leveraging. On Android, you've got the Java runtime you're leveraging. But if there's a construct that doesn't exist on either, we've got that polyfill that handles the trend that still works, right? Yeah, actually, one of the reasons we got synced up to record today was we actually put out a call like, we want to talk in Ruby with someone. And then somebody's like, oh, Dragon Ruby utilizes in Ruby. So... I'm going to pitch this question for those listening who may not know how MRuby works. And what I'm really asking is for myself. How do you, <laughs> yes, how do you utilize MRuby for Dragon Ruby? And you kind of hit on it there, but maybe even on like a more technical yeah, level, level of how it works. Yeah, absolutely. So the challenge with CRuby is that there's an assumption on the platforms it's running. So it's saying I'm running on PC Mac Linux on an x86 chipset architecture. And just recently, I think ARM64 was added and then you've got your WASM backend. So the problem is that when you're looking at consoles, they don't have these chipset architectures. It's not an x86 platform. So you can't simply just compile 
oh, I want to compile C Ruby to run these platforms because the compiler, the chipsets, it just won't work with it. So there's a lot of effort involved with getting that tool chain to compile against a specific chipset architecture and getting it compiled with some assumptions on standard libs. So on PC Mac Linux, you have standard libs for file access or standard libs for string. Some of these things don't exist in like a console environment. You don't have the same standard libs. So you try to compile a C Ruby and it's got a header that it's assuming is going to be there, but it doesn't exist. So that's like a, holy crap, what do you do in that situation? And that's where mRuby comes into the picture is that mRuby, the M stands for embedded. So the premises is that it's an isolated environment that doesn't assume what operating system or process or standard libs exist. So you can embed a very lightweight Ruby that you can code against and then expand on those form function interfaces to interrupt with like other systems. So one of the mRuby classes is file, right? So you can do file.read and file.read. It's in the core lib and assumes that you have access to standard libs to retrieve files, but it doesn't exist on console. So we have to create our own form function interface that says, how do you read a file cross-platform that takes care of mobile, iOS, Android, all those things. And because it has so few dependencies and assumptions on the OS itself, that's what makes it easy to embed into a C program. And that's the bridge is that once I can get embedded into a standard C program, then all these platforms have compilation chains that can compile C code. So it's like, I can use their custom compiler, compile this C code, which is just pure C, which has no assumptions on standard libs and compile against their chipset architecture. And back in 2018 is when we started development on this. You can't compile C Ruby to WASM. That just came out, I think this year. But we were able to do that with mRuby because of mscripten. So we use mscripten because it assumes straight C. We can embed mRuby in there. And we've got C on the web. And so the ability to access all these chipset architectures by not assuming anything for that core language piece is really powerful. So you're actually in this environment, I guess you would compile in Ruby and read that within C code? Exactly. Okay. And then so for, you're talking about file, for example, like a console has a different concept of what file means. There's not like a standard library right. for it. So you would actually write that, and I assume that's what FFI is here, that form function interface, yep. That interface so that you would write that in C so that something like mRuby code could understand that. And so when we compile mRuby, and we have the mRuby source locally, so our binary fully compiles and embeds that entire runtime inside of your game program. And one, it's small. And the other thing is that you have configurability options saying like, assume standard out doesn't exist in this platform or assume file access doesn't exist in this platform. And because of the configurability of mRuby, we can opt into specific OS dependencies and then remove all those things. So we say, okay, we're not going to assume standard lib file access or standard lib IO, standard on standard in, and we're going to roll our own and polyfill those pieces. And it's that configurability and that embeddability that gives us this capability to target literally any platform that has a C compiler. And that's incredibly powerful. Yeah. And from what it sounds like, it's most of them have some type of tool chain here for that. Yeah. Yep. Everything runs on C. Everything runs on C. There's a C compiler for it. And uh, the other amazing thing is that it's so tiny. The entire runtime is at 4.3 megabytes. You release the Dragon Ruby EXE, entire thing is 4.3 megabytes versus the hundreds of megabytes for a C Ruby installation. Wow. That's and it's amazing. zero dependency. Right. Right. When you start Dragon Ruby, the install process is amazing. You unzip and double click and you're ready to go. And it's because of mRuby and the ability to embed like that makes it such a nice experience. Yeah. And that makes sense too, because like when you buy Dragon Ruby, you get a zip file, you unzip it, the whole project's there, including like I assume like the actual source of the compiled source of Dragon Ruby. Exactly. That makes sense. So that's how that's distributed. Yeah. So I kind of got really excited, pushed us right into the nitty gritty of Dragon Ruby. But let's maybe zoom out a little bit and talk about the problem Dragon Ruby solves and why would somebody want to use it? It's awesome. And you get to build video games in Ruby. I mean, that in itself is great. But the problem is that it solves is a zero dependency runtime and programming environment that lets you render things to the screen accept IO, play sound, and have a program that doesn't assume anything about the platform that it's running on. And 
that cross-platform experience is really powerful because like with Ruby Motion, it's Mac only. Dragon Ruby Game Toolkit and this core that we're extracting out runs on PC Mac Linux. You can run it on the Raspberry Pi. If you go to fiddle.dragonruby.org, we have like an IDE, the JavaScript based IDE, and you can save the code and it will run it in the browser and you will see the updates live in the browser. And so that's the big value prop is that we want to be able to, especially as an indie game dev, deploying your game just to Windows is a death sentence. You're leaving 70% of your revenue on the table by not going to these other platforms, especially with the Steam Deck coming out and it being a Linux based OS. You're leaving so much money on the table. So the story around Having a single code base that deploys literally cross-platform and is available everywhere for commercial purchase is something that is extremely important when you're doing indie game development. And that code base is positioned in such a way that if you get approval for console, it will work. There's no porting process. A lot of the headache that exists with existing game engines out there, behind the scenes, it's an immense amount of effort to take a game that was like, oh, I made a game that was Windows only and it went great on Steam. Now I need to go to console. Holy crap. How do I read a file? Because you assume you're going to do file.read through the Windows APIs and it won't work. So that entire pain and those 11th hour challenges go away when you have a runtime that really is cross-platform and works everywhere. I just want to take a second to thank our sponsor, HoneyBadger.io. Do you currently use one service for uptime monitoring, another for error tracking, another for status pages, and yet another to monitor your cron jobs and microservices. Paying for all of those services separately may be costing you more than you think. If you want to simplify your stack and lower your bills, it's time to check out HoneyBadger. HoneyBadger combines all of those services into one easy platform. It's everything you need to keep production healthy and your customers happy. Best of all, HoneyBadger is free for small teams and setup takes as little as five minutes. Get started today at honeybadger.io. That's honeybadger.io. So we were talking a little bit before we started recording. I've been playing with Dragon Ruby. I couldn't be any more of a novice, like beginner when it comes to game development. And one of the things I do love about it is how simple it is to get started. And I want to kind of hear maybe your thoughts behind that. And maybe compared to something like Unity, which seems like I have to have a PhD in order just to like download it. I always make the comment, you'll have a Dragon Ruby game built and deployed before you can download and install Unity. I mean, it's just massive and they break every single version. But the simplicity, there's two facets to it. One of it is that a lot of the APIs, so we're moving past the runtime and going it. So there's Dragon Ruby and then Game Toolkit. So the game toolkit is that library and API aspect of it. So we're moving like up that stack. And so the API for game toolkit is actually really data oriented. So the idea is you can use classes, you can use tuples, you can use hashes, whatever data structure you want. You shovel these data structures into our render pipeline and it will render to the screen. So it's object oriented because it's Ruby, but the rendering pipeline and a lot of the environment centric APIs are all data oriented. And a lot of that was inspired actually by Clojure and just working in Clojure, their use of these like common data types, sets, tuples, hashes, they're extremely powerful. And that's one of the things that is kind of jarring when you look at the simplicity of game toolkit is that you're like, oh, it's just data, but that's the best part of it. It's just data. It serializes, you can do value comparison on it. It's all just data. That's one of the facets of the simplicity of the engine, why it's different than Unity, where to to render a sprite on the screen in Unity, you need to have a prefab. You need to use the IDE, create a prefab, put the prefab on the scene, associate a script object. In that script object, you have a component that you extract that's like a sprite renderer, which has an XYZ position. And to set the position of the sprite, you can't just set pixel value. You got to use quaternions. Yeah. And it's like, oh, great. Now I'm doing quaternion math, move a sprite across the screen. And the lack there is that it doesn't have that data-oriented facet to it. And when you remove that complexity, you get this inherent simplicity in the system that's still really powerful. Another part of the API, and I think this is really an observation that I've seen about the Ruby programming language, is that a lot of people say that, oh, there's so many ways to do things in Ruby. And they kind of see it as a criticism. And for me, what I see is that there's a spectrum of solutions that Ruby provides you. So you can do it quick and dirty and opt for speed of implementation versus something that's more robust at the end of it. 
And so like the concept, I coined the continuity of design. So continuity of design, TM. And so the idea is that you can define a variable inside a function and you say like foobar equals hello. But there's an interesting continuity is that if I wanted to promote that variable to be used elsewhere, I promote it to a method. And because the parentheses are optional, your call site doesn't change. And so that continuity is there. And now it's like, well, I'm going to use this method across multiple files. Well, you can promote that to a module and then include it. So you've got that next step of continuity. And then finally, the final step is the class. So that spectrum is available to you. Do you immediately go to a class that has a foobar function if you're only using it inside of one function? Probably not. You just create a variable. But it's that spectrum that's a very core part of the language that I think is not vocalized enough. And so last on to that, I said the API is going to have the same spectrum where you can do a simple array to render a thing, right? You do open bracket, zero comma, zero comma, 100, 100, and a string, and you've got a sprite rendering to the screen. Is that going to be sustainable long-term? Probably not. Then you want to go to hashes or name parameters, and then that still works. And you're like, now I want to go to classes and have something that has more object-oriented concepts, but that spectrum is still available to you. So those two big things are what sets Dragon Ruby apart from these other engines is that simplicity, the upfront simplicity, the data-oriented API, and then that continuity of design where you can expand the complexity of your system as you need it, as opposed to having to do quaternions up front. I love hearing you explain that because that's literally like, maybe the docs walk you through that, but that was literally my process of like, I started with an array and then I refactored it to a hash and then I stayed in hash land. I didn't. For a while, uh, you can, hashes are so great. They're really powerful, but yeah. I also noticed that I can take a hash and use dot syntax on it. Is that something you just kind of syntactically added? Yeah, so we added that to our, so you've got your runtime and then I guess the next level up is your core lib and then you've got your library. So that we added into our core lib to give you that exact continuity. So you can make it quack like an object or a class and then defer the need to move to a class by because of that dot syntax. And there's gotchas, right? The length is on hash, so we don't shadow those properties and there'll be some situation there. But it's kind of like that pleasant transition that, that kind of helps that evolution. And you'll notice that even the tuple arrays have a dot X. You're like, where did dot X come from? But those are expansions to the core lib that we added to, to help streamline that continuity. I think it was just from my standpoint as a beginner, it made it so approachable. It made it fun. I even sent you a Twitter DM after like three hours of messing with it, just because it made me feel like, oh, I can do this. I think the philosophy is spot on. I think it's awesome. And I think that's another aspect of game development and encouraging Ruby devs to get into game development is that it's a place for you to play. We've got Rails, we've got all these existing, very mature processes of doing development. But with that maturity and that craftsmanship, we lose the innovation. So game dev, it lets you play. You can make mistakes. You can try different things. It's enriching. It makes you a better developer. I added a portal mechanic to one of my recent games, adding like portals where you've got like a portal gun and you show up and that's a business domain problem that I've never, ever encountered before. But they're interesting and new problems to solve. But yeah, innovate, make mistakes, play. This is where you can do it. I mean, that's what I felt. I spent a lot of time thinking about they spent a lot of time thinking about the web. It was just kind of fun to escape almost. It like felt like I was learning programming again, that excitement, except I didn't have to necessarily learn everything new because I knew Ruby. And so that's exactly. really exciting. I, in college, wanted to be a game dev. I was like, yes. I like games. I want to be a game dev. I started learning Unity. I was taking courses in it. And I was like, this is ridiculously hard. I don't like the Unity syntax for C Sharp or whatever. I was like, this is... Ugh, don't like this. And then shortly after, people introduced me to Ruby. And I was like, this I like. And I kind of gave up on my dreams of being a game dev until I saw Dragon Ruby years later. And I was like, wait, <laughs> maybe I can yeah. still be a game dev. You can. And I mean, it's I eat my own dog food. I mean, I think that's another important thing is that you've got a lot of great titles on Unity, but the devs that build Unity don't build games with Unity. And it's just insane. It's like, how can you do this? How can you use a tech system like that? Unreal, I've got nothing but good things to say about Unreal. If you're going to do a 3D game, you've got multi-million dollar budget, go for Unreal. Because they build Epic Builds games with their engine. And it's a testament to that. But yeah, commercial game dev is possible because literally my entire livelihood is built on commercial products, built off this technology. And there's approaches, especially as developers, We've got the superpower where 
we can code things from nothing and we can create things just from code and monetize them. And so there is a path to where that dream can still happen. You keep your full-time job and do this kind of on the side. That's why I started coding, right? I'm a kid, 14 years old. I want to build a video game. And that's been my dream. I was 31 when I finally got to it, but it's never too late. It really isn't. Yeah. So you mentioned you've had four or five games after a dark room. How many of those are Ruby Motion? How many of those Dragon Ruby? So everything is built with Ruby Motion. In 2018 is when I got Nintendo Switch, but I was already hitting that point of upkeep where I'm like, if I want to sustainably do this and have new titles and not worry about the upkeep, I need to solve this cross-platform problem because it's a very real problem. That's where I was like, I need to take a step back and figure out how to fix this upkeep issue, especially with like the new release cycle, yearly release cycle. So that's what happened. Again, the great thing, the backend code, it's all plain old Ruby objects. So I can port a lot of that over. And then when it comes to getting these titles on new platforms, I now have that ability to do that. I can now deploy to Steam. I can port my other other projects to the Nintendo Switch or what have you and itch.io and web. So a lot of my core games are still in Ruby motion. There's facets of it that are being ported over as I explore new platforms. I mean, at this point, I'm at like 76,000 lines of code. It's a lot of code. And yeah. it's Ruby Motion not going anywhere. It still works. And it's just a matter of saying, okay, how can we consolidate this into this single core? And I just take it one game at a time. Which game were you able to get onto the Switch? It was a dark room. So dark room. Was, yeah, that was the first title. So when that port happened, then it was like, okay, I finally have one code base, thankfully. Finally. And that was about 20,000 lines of code. So the game code and the air quotes business logic was about 15,000 lines of that. So being able to just get rid of that other 5,000 lines, the upkeep is gone. And it's just a really good feeling from that perspective. I was going to ask, so if someone's listening and wanted to obviously make a game for fun, but let's say they actually did want to try and get into like, I want to make a game. I want to try and sell it. What's some advice you would give them? The best advice I can give is you want to take advantage of the fact that you're an indie game dev. So you're not a faceless company. You're a human being. So when you, air quotes, market your game, be like, hey, I'm a mirror. This is who I am. These are the games that I like. And this is why I'm building this. And what you also want to do is you want to target hyper niche communities. So don't build the generic XYZ FPS or Candy Crush clone. You can't compete on that scale specifically from a marketing standpoint user acquisition, you just can't. But there are so many underserved communities that are obsessed with Metroidvanias or are obsessed with a specific type of strategy game. And those are the type of communities that you can specifically target. So you want to target hyper niche and you want to build a lot of small games quickly. So the idea there is that usually I put a 240 hour dev hour limit on my games. So in a concrete example is there's an anime called Initial D, but it's got a cult following. It's an anime about racing cars. It's the AE86, which is like this Toyota Corolla from back in the day. And this kid driving a Toyota Corolla beats everyone. And the number of games out there that cater to that audience that loves that anime, it's very small, right? A big company is not going to target that. So I built a game specifically about driving the AE86 on one of the iconic mountain passes in Japan called Akina. And I cater specifically to the Initial D community. So there's subreddits for Initial D. And I post them and say, hey, I love the anime. Here's my, you know, sport uh, Subaru WRX, which is like, I am one of y'all. And I'm building this game and here's what I'm trying to accomplish. And here's the feel that I want to get out of that. So you build that relationship with that community and they know me as a person. So when I release it, they're like, I'm going to buy your game. And that kind of shifts the world is that, you're not looking at freemium. You're not looking at ad-based stuff. They're going to purchase your game. And it's a small amount of money. It's not going to be millions of dollars, but if you make maybe $100 a month. But $100 a month on a three-month investment doesn't sound like a great return, but the long tail is massive for that. It stays around for a very long time. And so you build a new experience on that cadence, catering to these specific communities, either as follow-up DLCs or other than just best weeding simulator, something that caters to those specific communities. And over time, you've got these array of products that lift you up and suddenly you're making $400 a month. That's a car payment for life. It's a car payment. And when you frame it like that and you say, this is something I can do 240 hours, target a hyper niche community, 
find that community, be a, a member of it, get that small money. And if it does well, great. If it doesn't, okay, try another community or try another spin. And just catering to those small environments where you don't have competition from these large companies. And that's how you can make it as an indie. It may depend on the community, but do you have a recommendation for a platform people start to target as like their first? I do primarily Reddit. I'll go to like a subreddit. If a subreddit has a million people, it's probably too big. But if you can find a subreddit that has like 50,000 people, then you're like, okay, this is something that I can target. And kind of the math that I do in my head is like, okay, if it's 50,000 people, I get a 2.5% conversion rate over the lifetime of my app. Does the math work out? Does it make sense? Do the numbers work out to where it's worth investing that specific time? And I think that's primarily what I use as a community. I know some game does use Facebook. I occasionally post to Facebook groups that are like specifically around a specific community. And analytics are just kind of tricky to track from that perspective. But yeah, these small communities is really what you want to target. And think about the games you love and that you grew up in. It's like, I love this game to death. Well, take that game that you love and remove things from it. So it's like, okay, I liked Final Fantasy Tactics. Okay, I love Final Fantasy Tactics. If I remove the storyline, will I still love it? Yes. If I removed all the classes except for the Lancer and Samurai, would I still love it? Yes. And so you pare it down to this distilled experience. And you're like, if I made a Final Fantasy Tactics that just had the Samurai, you have all the cool Samurai abilities and you just destroy bosses, would that be a fun game? I would play it. And that's what you bring toward to Final Fantasy Tactics fans. It's like, I built a distilled experience that centers around the skills of a samurai. And it's a single thing. And that's something that you can actually release in a short period of time and actually monetize. And then you build out from there. But yeah, that's the idea. So small game, small community, and then be the human that you are. Yeah. You use Dragon Ruby and you build something like this. Do you push it out to every device type you can? Or do yep. you... Okay. From day one. So the interesting thing there is that you might set it to free on a specific device that can serve as a loss heater. So like for initial D, the desktop version is actually free. So you get it off my itch page and you play it in the web, but the mobile versions are for pay. So PC and desktop versions end up being the loss leader because they'll bring it up in the web, play a little bit. Hey, I like this. It's fun. And I'm, Man, I'm going to play this while I'm standing in line. Well, then they actually download on mobile. So you have options to kind of like cross pollinate and kind of shift your monetization strategies from that perspective. But that's the other thing is that from a marketing standpoint, you can do search engine optimization for maybe one area, but the best way to get more eyes on your product is to have it on as many platforms as possible because that's how they're going to find it. And literally one click deployment for this stuff, you call Dragon Ruby Publish and you get those binaries that come out. It's so little effort and you get more eyes it helps a lot. It yeah. lifts the tide for everything. So we've talked about the Switch. We've talked about mobile phones, WASM, support for Xbox and PlayStation available. Yeah, absolutely. And then I so, read on the, maybe the Dragon Root, like when you go to purchase it, a certain license comes with being able to do platform support. And I got the vibe that it's a little more difficult. Like maybe there's more red tape for getting to yes. Xbox and PlayStation. Yeah. So we have to do NDA verification. So we can't give you access to those binaries and those pieces of documentation unless we've done NDA verification. So you say, hey, I've got access to the console. We go to their specific console forums and make sure that you can log in and verify. And then we provide you the upgraded license tier to get those binary exports. And when you're going to console, I mean, if you don't have $10,000 in the bank to support the initial dev devices and all the machinery that you need to build, Console is probably not the first thing that you want to target. But when you have approval for console, you're getting into the higher license tiers. But I mean, you're already dropping 10 grand at the initial investment. So it's how it works. That's interesting. So like if I wanted to deploy a game to like my PS5, then I would actually like set up some type of partnership with Sony directly. Exactly. And then you would verify that that relationship exists. And then you can get the Dragon exactly. Ruby game. Yeah, and you, you have to pitch to them. They're really selective. I actually pitched Darkroom directly as a direct publisher and they declined me. They said, no, it's like this game has close to 3 million downloads at this point and wildly successful, highly rated. And they said, no, thank you. So I had to go through a publisher and do that. So the entire process, they want established developers. They want to see that you've done something. And then even with all the cards stacked in your favor, they could potentially still say no. So it's a difficult process, but you have to start somewhere. 
Yeah, it makes me maybe hate the iOS app store approval a little less than I used to. The approval and the distribution on console is terrifying. It's terrifying. Your releases can take 20 business days. So if you've got a zero day bug, 20 business days before you actually get it fixed. Wow. It's, it's terrifying. But yeah, that's why it's so important to have things that this better freaking work when I release there. And there's a lot of money involved with doing ports and stuff. You'll end up spending a lot. Well, this has been awesome. I'm excited to talk to you about all this stuff. I'm excited to keep using Dragon Ruby. And I did actually have one other question I wanted to ask. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, like I'm like, hey, I can put a sprite on the screen, like moving around with some keyboard arrows. Look at me, I'm a badass. But then I like watch your RubyConf presentation and if I'm not mistaken, you actually like, you didn't use like Keynote. You actually made your RubyConf <laughs> presentation in Dragon Ruby. In Dragon Ruby, I, yep. Super badass move. But at a high level, like you had just really smooth graphics and we'll link to the talk in the show notes. But I'm kind of curious, at a high level, how do you build something that is more graphically involved than say just putting a PNG on the screen and moving it around? So one thing as far as like leveling up your dev skills, Dragon Ruby, the engine comes with like, I think at this point, 160 sample apps that increase in difficulty. So you start with like super simple stuff. And then we have reference implementations. Like this is a full-blown game that uses all these different facets and shows you how to like compose something that has a bit more complexity. That will help like if you just literally go through them in order, that's going to help that foundational aspect. And the other thing is that just good art. So all the art that you saw, if I replace them with just like little squares and borders, you can like deconstruct and say, okay, he's got a sprite for the boat, replace that with a border. He's got a sprite for the ripples on the water. That's just a ripple sprite with an alpha transparency that fades away. It's just another sprite. And everything's a sprite. Everything's a sprite. And the boat animation, if he's looking 90 degrees away, well, I just use a different sprite for when he's facing 90 degrees away versus when he's facing left or right. And then it's all just sprites. So the wow factor unfortunately, it's just really nice art. And it's just a matter of just like layering that on top of each other in the right draw order and letting it roll. You say, unfortunately, but what I hear is... It's so oh, I, I could do that. Like, you can do this, yes. I don't have to necessarily like get into learning, doing it. There's some math, but I don't have to necessarily like go down this huge like thought process of how to make this happen purely with numbers. It's all sprites and transparencies and colors. And it's amazing what you can do with those simple properties. It's just a, it's that composability of that that makes it so powerful. That's super yeah. helpful to hear. Buy good assets, basically. Okay. Any kind of upcoming features, things in the pipeline you're willing, yeah, so for the, interested to talk about? Yeah. So for the pipeline, we're expanding our Steam Deck support. So we're going to add a kind of like an auditing process that helps you pass a lot check. So it's a handle device. So it's like, okay, have you taken touch into consideration? Are you configured for the controllers that exist for that specific environment? Did you include internationalization and regionalization? So a lot of those things that end up becoming important when you start distributing internationally, especially on console. So we're adding some of those like nice facilities in there. And then the other big thing that we're doing is that we're working on something called Firestorm. And the idea there is that we're expanding the runtime to have AOT compilation. So your Ruby code that you write will get compiled down to native bit code and execute from that perspective. And so that gets into a lot of like the LLVM tool chain. So it's a compiler infrastructure that allows you to parse code and then emit machine code from that. So that's the next step that we're working on. It's like, we have our Ruby code, we can run it, but can we run it really fast? And that's the exciting thing that we're working on. Hopefully we'll have an alpha beta release coming out this year for that. But yeah, an AOT compiled Ruby implementation is our target. That's awesome. Yeah, it's fun. Chris, Andrew, I've been selfishly just asking every question I've ever had about Dragon Ruby for an hour and Ruby Motion. Y'all have anything? Could keep oh. listening for like another hour, yeah. honestly. I'm just soaking it in. Same here. I was going to say a cheeky joke of Ruby is not even fast enough to build Rails app, so how could you possibly make video games with Ruby? But yeah, we've got a tech demo. If you Google Dragon Ruby versus Unity, I show a rendering of 20,000 sprites on the screen. I've seen that. 60 frames per second. And then Unity's getting like eight. And that goes back to, well, Ruby isn't slow. What runtime are you talking about? And that's our bar. We're already faster than Unity. And it's just ridiculous. Even our collision logic. Whenever I get that, I just, here's a YouTube video and they see and they go, 
oh, oh, well, okay. And that's usually where the conversation stops, but it's fast. It's very fast. That's awesome. Like Andrew was saying earlier, I got into programming because I was playing games on DOS on my dad's computer yep. and figured out playing Duke Nukem that the high scores list is just a text file. And I like, yes, was re- change it. really like, really kind of disappointed when I just changed it and it actually updated. And I was like, oh, so this is not like real verification or anything. But it like makes you realize, wow, all this stuff is very doable. You know, as a programmer, you don't have to roll a lot of the stuff with like sprites, for example. You don't have to worry about the actual rendering steps yourself. The underlying stuff is done for you. You're using that API that takes care of switching the pixels and everything. And that's where I started originally back in writing QBasic. I went and like took a picture of the TV for Mario and like drew every pixel on a napkin or something and then wrote some code to like make this pixel red and this one red and this one blue. We have, and we have a sample app that is the Gorilla's basic implementation. We re-implemented in Ruby and then you can exactly do the same. You can change the code live and change the banana gravity to be like 300 and just see it fall directly uh, or fly right off the screen. We did Gorilla's basic exactly for that reason. Incredible. And, Y'all have the superpower. Take advantage of it. And you can do it sustainably. You don't have to quit your day job. Just build those like little experiences. Be genuine. Cater to those communities. And it's good money. You're bringing me back to my grade school days of just purely programming for fun. Because there's this whole world available that you can make anything you dream of. You're making games. You're doing things for fun. It's like yeah, not, it's not it really, hopefully it's not as magical. it's not as work feel or whatever. Yeah, you'll feel the magic again, especially after doing Ruby for so long. You start building games and you're like, this is how I felt when I first started using Ruby. And it's how it feels. It's good for the soul. Seriously. The final thing I wanted to chat about and actually also just tell you is that I respect and support the fact that you charge for Dragon Ruby. I see people like on Reddit or different places like, why do I have to pay for it? But like, that is how you get to keep doing cool stuff like this that brings us joy. If you want to talk about the reasoning behind that, that's cool. But I just want to say I support that. And Yeah, I think a lot of open source devs, they get burned out specifically for that reason, because they do a lot of this work and they get something. And now they, they have this responsibility and they get very little compensation return. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that Lawyers don't accept the GitHub stars like NDAs and EULAs and, and console and real money is involved. So I wish lawyers accepted GitHub stars, but they do not. We've got to pay for those things. And the other thing is that I'll never put anyone out. We've got a literal thing at the bottom that says, if you can't afford $32 for the standard, just email me and I'll set you up with the license. It's just that simple. And I think it's extremely important for developers to think about long-term sustainability because burnout is very real and this is how we do it. And we care. We want you all to succeed. And if you're not gainfully employed and then the top 5% income earning, go ahead. I'll give it to you for free. But our target is less than an annual subscription for Netflix. So that's kind of our high-end target. Yeah. Another way you could frame it too is you mentioned you have what 160 examples of how to build a game in Dragon Ruby. You're not just necessarily paying for Dragon Ruby. You're also paying for education on how to use it all in one. And I got your back. I'm in it. I'm doing indie dev and I feel your pain. So you hit me up on Discord if you've got problems. And no other CEO is going to tell you that. You can't contact you need a CEO and be like, hey, I've got this problem in my game. But I'm right there going, I feel this pain and we'll fix it and make it better. And guess what? I'm able to do it because I'm sustainable. Like I could sustainably do it. It's not something I do in my free time. So you know, yeah, there's I, a lot of value there. I think it's great that you do that. And I'm more than willing to support something that even just brings me joy, even if I never sell yeah. the game. I spent $3,000 on custom keyboards and mechanical stuff. That's right. Like a hundred year license for Dragon Ruby. And it's like, come on, it's a <laughs> hobby. You pay for hobbies with no plan of making money. So enjoy it. Have fun. It's worth it. Well, thank you for taking time to sit down with us. Talk all things Ruby and game development. Where can people find you online? I'm on Twitter and Mastodon. So at Amir Razan in both those places. And on Mastodon, I'm on ruby.social. So at amirrazan.ruby.social. And then the Discord community, I'm always there. So discord.dragonruby.org will get you over to that community, which is 
phenomenal. I would definitely encourage you all to join. And then my email, amirrajan.net. Happy to respond in any one of those ways. Awesome. And the Discord is a great place, I've noticed, for getting all the updates. Yep. Like new version of Dragon Ruby, there's always really detailed, hey, here's what's changed. And that happens in yep. Discord. And that's a really cool place to get those notifications. Yep. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And Chris Andrew, by the time this aired, they've all hung out at RailsCon. So see you next week. Yes, sir. See you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Bye.